First Thessalonians chapter number two. Verse number five is where we're going to start reading. And then here in a minute we're going to turn a few pages, go to Second Thessalonians, but First Thessalonians chapter number two, verse number five. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherith her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear to us, dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holy, holily, and justly, and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how, we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Now in this passage, the Apostle Paul right into the church of Thessalonica. He's putting him in remembrance of a few things. But he's also explaining why he did things the way that he did and why he taught them the things that he did. I've learned that it's one thing to know why, you know, know that something is true. It's a different reason to know why something is true. Right? Somebody may tell you something that is important, but it's a completely different thing when you understand why it's important. Right? There's responsibility there. Matt, yeah, anybody remember when you as kids and your parents asked you to do something you don't understand why, so you didn't do it? Right? Same thing, only bigger consequences here. Right? The preacher can get up and preach until he's blue in the face on you know how we need to live or the things that we need to do to become more spiritual or closer to God. But the truth is, until God speaks to your soul and tells you that you need to do it, and why you need to do it, right? Just duck off of a water's back. Why do you think the Bible says that in the last days it'd be a famine for the hearing of the word? Right? People aren't interested in understanding why things need to be done a certain They want the easy way. They want the paths of least resistance. Right, truly, the only way to have something become important to you in your life is to beg God to reveal unto you what you need to do and, if He'll reveal it, why it's important. Right now, it's a very, very dangerous thing to ask God why because there's two different ways you can do it. There is the way that we heard about on Wednesday night. Right, our pastor talking about the disciples privately went to the Lord and asked Him about the prophecy that he gave about the temple falling down and in three days he'd rebuild it. That's talking about his earthly body. Then he made the prophecy that there would be a time that that great temple would, no, st no stone would be standing on top of one of the other stones. And they said, Lord, how can that be? Not accusingly, not going to him irreverently, but they're saying, Lord, can you help us understand? Then there are the people to get on my nerves that just say, well, why did God have this happen? Because he's God. There's a difference between knowing why something happened and a difference saying, Lord, help me understand how to do what you want me to do. Right? One is, Lord, I already recognize that your ways are better than my ways. They're higher than my ways they're beyond finding out. I know that your way is the right way, but Lord, help me understand how I can do it better. Help me understand right, the urgency and the importance behind what you've given me to do. And then the other one is, well, Lord, why do I have to do that? Two different things. One, you're rebelling against God's will and saying, Lord, prove to me that I need to do things your way. And the other, you're saying, Lord, I've already submitted to your will. I'm just asking you to help me do your will. Well, here the Apostle Paul, 
He says, when we came, right, we didn't use flattering words. Right? In fact, you go and find out that they preached to them the whole word again. Some of the gospel isn't flattering to the flesh. Right? It rebukes the flesh. It cuts against the flesh. Right? It makes the flesh feel like it's sin cursed, which it is. Right? That's not a pleasant experience. But he didn't come using flattering words. No, he just gave them the truth. Right? They didn't use a cloak of covetousness. What's that? They weren't double handed in their practices with them. They wouldn't say, well, we'll share the gospel with you if you feed us for the day. No. It goes on, verse number six, they didn't seek glory of men. They were there for one purpose and one purpose alone, to bring glory and honor to God, but also to take the gospel to those that needed it. They didn't care what the you know, so-called blue bloods of the day thought of them. All they cared about was what God thought about them. But in verse number 7, although they didn't use flattering words, although they weren't blowing sunshine at everybody that they talked to, right? Some people didn't like it, but what they say, said that they were gentle. Right? I mean, the Bible says that if a man can offend not in word, that that's a testament of the fact that he's learned how to reign in his flesh. If you can say what's true, but not offend the other person. In other words, drive a wedge between you and another person. That's a testament according to God that you've reined your flesh in. You're no longer letting emotion drive you. You're no longer letting the impulses of the carnal man drive you. Instead, you've fully been able to rein in your flesh and compel it to do that which God has instructed you to do. He says, we said some things that were very controversial. Keep in mind, this is the same guy that when they went into Greece, right? there was a big old pantheon of all these different gods because they didn't want to leave any of them out. And then they left one over there that said to the unknown God, just in case they didn't figure out one of them that they needed to be worshiping. And the Apostle Paul stood up and preached and told them how every single one of their gods in that pantheon Right, didn't exist, had no power. But yet at the end of it, they're thanking him because he told them the truth. He said very controversial things, but he did it gently. Right, he did it with care. Why? Because, verse number 8, being so affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the, the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because ye were dear to us. He says... We imparted part of ourselves unto you. He said, you could tell that when we were teaching, we weren't preaching to try and prove you wrong. They weren't having a debate in the middle of the town square. Right? It was a pleading call that if you don't receive what it is that I have to offer, you're destined for an eternity in hell. Right? They did it with love. He said, as the love of a nurse for a child. They cared, which is why even though they had to confront them with the fact that what they believed wasn't right, that all of their traditions and their rituals wasn't going to get them anything any, you know, for all of eternity, at the same time, because they loved them, they did it. How? Gently. Right? It's one thing for the person to say, this isn't going to hurt, and then rip the Band-Aid off, it hurts. Right? If some people, if they really care, because it takes a little bit of extra step, they'll go and they'll get a wet washcloth and soak the band-aid first, and then it just comes right off. Both of them, you're doing the right thing. Right? Probably getting ready to change the bandage. Right? Check up on how the cut's healing. Right? But there's a difference between doing what's right and doing what's right in the gentle way. Did not they say that Christ was meek and lowly? That he turned no man away? I mean, he only loved us with an everlasting love. Everyone that came to him in earnest, what did he do? He answered their question. They left different than the way that they came. But see, they didn't just go and start causing pain with the words. 
I mean, it may have cut to the heart. It may have cut the flesh, but they didn't offend them. In fact, they were appreciative of the fact that they had preached the truth unto them. Said we were gentle. Now, you wouldn't want me as a doctor, especially a surgeon. You say, why, brother? I've just got this habit where I'm a bull in a china shop. Doesn't matter what it is. You want to demolition a house? I'm your guy. You don't even have to tell me you're tearing it down. I'll just find a way to bring the whole thing down. You give me enough time. But I don't mean to. Just that's how things are. Right? You give me something sharp and tell me to put it into a very small space, chances are it's going to hit some stuff it's not supposed to. Right? But also, if you've got a broken bone, you don't want me setting it. I've got the chance to, you know, the way my mind works is, and this may be wrong, but if it's worth doing, it's worth doing with everything you got. So if you've got a broken arm, you may walk away with two broken, you know, two bones broken if you want me to reset it for you. Well, well I know it's going to take a lot of effort to get this thing back. Let's just give it everything we got. Right? That's not always the best approach. There is this thing called moderation. Right? Knowing your limits. Never learned that one yet. We're working on it. Well, you say, there's been a lot of things I've tried to put together that I broke because the thing that was supposed to go right here wouldn't go right there, so I made it go right there, and then it broke. That's not how the Apostle Paul and those that went with him on his mission trip, not how they handled the gospel. They weren't forcing it into anywhere. They're very gentle. But the message that they had was controversial. It wasn't flattering. But the way that they delivered it, they weren't hateful. They weren't judgmental. What was the biggest rebuke that the Pharisees had to Jesus? That he was the friend of publicans and sinners. He, they didn't turn those away. They came to him. They didn't care where they came from. All they cared about was the fact that they wanted to know more about Christ. They dealt with the person gently, but they dealt with the sin very seriously. He said, we were gentle to you. Because although you were in sin, that doesn't mean that you are sin. Right? Hate the sin, love the soul. That's how Christ viewed it. He said, if you ask us, we'd tell you the truth that sin, sin. And it's going to send you to hell. But he says, but when it came to you, we were very gentle in giving you the gospel. He said, because we loved you, we cared for you. In fact, he said that the... They left part of their soul there with them. What does that mean? They were very dear to them. They had a place in the apostles' heart. Why? Because God had given them a burden for those people. So he gave everything that he had to them. Then, skip on down if you will, verse number 11. And you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father to his children that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. He says, after they got saved, we charged them. He says, exhorted. You know, exhorted in the New Testament, you know what that word means? It just means preached. They preached unto them. Right? Well then, it says, and comforted. But what's comforting? Well, sometimes... You guys ever notice during the middle of the preaching that the pastor all of a sudden you know, you know go over here for no reason and he's dealing with a example on you know this happened one time and you know, this is how God fixed the situation this is you know God gave me this verse and that helped me through this situation you ever wonder why the Holy Ghost tells the preacher to do things like that because there's somebody out in the audience that needs to be comforted. He's not preaching at that moment. What's he doing? Preaching took him. Holy Ghost said, hey, we'll get back to preaching. Somebody needs to hear this. And it may be a comfort unto him. Right? But then it also says, it goes on, and charged. Now you can charge while you're comforting, and you can charge while you're exhorting. What's that? That's putting somebody into the realization or trying to help somebody realize how important it is that they do something. If you give somebody a charge, you're entrusting them with a duty. 
But when you entrust someone with the duty, you also have to convey the seriousness of that duty. Right? You don't put somebody and just say, hey, watch this door for the rest of the night. Right? Just stay here and make sure nobody goes in, nobody goes out. Well, it's locked, isn't it? Yeah. Well, then why do I need to be here? Right? Wouldn't be surprised if you find that guy sleeping on the job. A whole different thing if you give the guy a uniform and say, hey, this is a bank, and at night we don't want people breaking in. We got a whole lot of security, but you're the first line of defense. Something happens, call the police. Something happens, get inside and hit that panic button. Right? Same situation, but one of them, you let the guy know how important the job that he was doing really was. The other one, you're just giving, we don't just, somebody get saved and say, here you go, good luck. Right? Part of the growing process as a Christian is understanding this thing called spirituality, this thing that God called us under his ministry, under the kingdom of God, he entrusted us with the most valuable thing on the entire earth. That's the gospel of Christ. Right? It's one thing to say, well, you should go out and witness. It's another thing to say, God expects you to go out and witness. God expects you to go out and witness not how you want to witness, but how God wants you to go out and witness. God wants you to not only witness by the direction of the Holy Ghost, He wants you to live by the direction of the Holy Ghost. There's a difference between committing something unto somebody. That means just giving them the list. There's another thing to charge somebody with an action or with a duty. Right? Well, that's part of that, like we talked about earlier, the difference between understanding, well, this is what God expects and this is why God expects it. Why does God expect it? Because He gave His best for you and He expects your best from you. But also, the ways of God, arm of flesh is going to fail you. You can't do it. You have to do it His way because the only way He's going to do it is if you're obedient to do it the way that He said. Right? Let's look at... don't know why Jericho's on my mind, but we heard about Rahab last week, Brother Sidney. If they'd have walked around the city six times on the seventh day, walls wouldn't have come down. They'd have walked around it seven times but not blown all them trumpets. Wouldn't have come down. If they'd have blown the trumpets but all of Israel didn't shout with a great voice, walls wouldn't have come down. Was it their walking? Was it the shouting? Was it the trumpets that brought the wall down? No. But God said, here's what you can do and I'll take care of the rest. So he expected them to do what they could do. You say, well, that was silly. No, it was a sign of the fact that they trusted God. Right? They had to live by faith for their faith to be rewarded. Because you could say you believe all day long, but until you put your faith into practice and live it, it's all sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. Proof's in the pudding. I think I've said this before. But that comes from tapioca pudding, that phrase. Real tapioca pudding has little morsels of bread in it, dough. Right? Well, back in the day, there was one person that came out with the tapioca pudding. Well, the other guy couldn't figure out how to make the dough, so he just made the tapioca pudding part without the bread in it. And then all around town, people are asking, well, which one's the right one? That one is. Like, because the proof's in the pudding. That looks right. It's the right color. But you can't see the bread on the inside of the tapioca from staring at the bowl. Or if you go down to Kroger, you can't see it from the little clear... Pa you can see the color of it, but you don't know if there's a bread in there or not. You want to know how you find out? you got to ask somebody that's t tried it. Hey, is that the real stuff or was that the fake stuff? No, that was the real stuff. How do you know? The proof was in the pudding. Take a big old bite out of it. Guess what's in there? Bread? That's the real stuff. The other stuff, just like that fudge jello, it, it wiggles and you know it's got the right texture. It may have the right taste, but there's something missing on the inside. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? Living by faith, that's when the bread gets into your pudding. 
You may have the right color. You may have the right taste. You may know everything that you may need to know. You may have studied as much as God wants you to study, but until you go and do it, right, there's no substance to it. Don't know how we got onto this, but faith, what is it? The essence of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. You know what that means? The evidence of things unseen means even though you haven't seen it, you believe it's there, so you go after it. It's action. Evidence. You hope for it, meaning that you believe you're going to get it. That hope doesn't mean that, well, I, if it happens, that'd be great. No. True hope means that you believe it. And evidence of the fact of the unseen, that's not that God's going to roll back the clouds and show you that, hey, what you believe is true. Right? There's enough proof right here for you to believe everything you need to believe. Right? And he gave us the earnest of the Holy Ghost on top of it. Right? Just icing on the cake. But that evidence of things unseen, that's not talking about that your faith, God's going to give you the evidence of the things unseen. No, your faith is evidence of things unseen. You believe it so much, even though you haven't seen it, that your faith actually works its way out and changes the way that you live. You want to know the evidence that the world's going to find that what we have is real? The fact that you live by your faith. Right? Faith is the essence of things hoped for, but I believe it so much that it changed the way that I live. That's the evidence of the unseen. That something so real to us on the inside that it changed us from the inside out. That's the evidence to the world that your faith is real. Don't know how we got on that, but you're welcome. Okay, but the Apostle Paul said, they exhorted, comforted, and charged every one of them to do what? Verse number 12. That ye would walk worthy of God who called you unto his kingdom and glory. He said, we preached, we comforted, we charged. Right? We helped answer your questions. We helped convey to you the importance of walking worthy of God that called you. And we also preached unto you to give you the instructions on what God expects. But he said, it was pretty important that they took that much time and devoted that much effort. Right? Well, turn with me a few pages, if you will. Go to Second Thessalonians. Okay, now the chapter number three. Verse number three says, But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things which we commanded you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. What's he saying? We know that you're going to do what we've commanded you in this epistle. Why? Because they did the things that they were instructed to when the Apostle Paul was there and preached unto them. He said, we preached unto you that you walk worthy. How important that was. Then he says, we believe that the instructions we've given to you in this epistle, you're going to do them. Because the instructions that he gave them in the last epistle, because long before we got to chapter number 5 in the last epistle, guess what? He's giving them some more instruction. Well, between the first and the second letter, what happened? They took it to heart and they just did it. And he says, so when it comes to this one, we also believe that you're just going to do what God's instructed you to do that you've committed it to heart. And then, he says, verse number 5, the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. He says, you've been committed to do what God has given you to do. And we believe that the Lord's going to direct your hearts to take what you've been entrusted with and take it to those that it needs to be given to. That when you get there, that God gives you the patience. It says, and in the patient waiting for Christ. Right? How many times 
Do things in our life depend not on if God's going to do it, not on if there's a need to do it, not on if we're prepared to do it, but just whether or not we're patient enough to wait for God to open His timing, to open the door. Right? He tells us to sit down, and we don't want to sit and wait as long as we need to. Or He tells us to just walk in a general direction. And we ask the Lord, how much longer? And He says, just be patient, just keep walking. He said, if a man compelled you to go a mile, and we go with him twain. But well, that was somebody that the Jews hated, the Romans. How many miles would you walk for one that loves you supremely and that you love with everything? He says, just be patient. He said, I know that the Lord's going to direct you. I know that He's going to give you the patience so that what? We can see the finished work that God called us unto. Are we going to be able to see the results of every track that we hand out? No. But every now and then, he just lets us find out what happened. Somebody come down, walk the aisle, get saved. Somebody that is raised in church got away from church, or they just moved here, used to have a great church, feel like God brought them this way. Well, what happened? They find out about our church. They come and they say, hey, we've been looking for this for years. What is that? That's the Lord rewarding our faithfulness and our patience. We get to see the effects. Nowhere does he promise that we'll get to see him. But he does promise that our patience would be rewarded. That our labor in the Lord's not in vain. Well, if you're like most people, you labor, you labor, you labor. If you don't see any effects, you convince yourself or you let the world convince you, you let the devil convince you that everything you're doing doesn't have a point. The Apostle Paul's just saying, if the Lord directed your heart, just lean on Him. Let Him give you patience. And guess what? In the end, you'll find the proof in your own pudding. You'll see the effects of it. We may convince ourselves that we ought to have more fruit, but God just says, bear fruit. Be fruitful. He said, some will bring 10, 100. doesn't matter. All you got to do is bear fruit. Fruit's up to Him. But the growing, the casting the seed, that's up to us. Look, if you will, verse number one of Second Thessalonians, chapter number one, Second Thessalonians. Okay, verse number twelve, last verse of the chapter. That the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in Him, according to the grace of our God in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the end goal. Everything that he had taught them up to this point. He said, you want to know why we instructed you to walk worthy of what you've been entrusted with? Which is the gospel. The good news of God's only begotten Son. To walk worthy of that means that you've accomplished verse number 12 that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. What's that? That's where the Apostle Paul wrote that, yet if I live, not I, but Christ liveth in me. He's saying, as long as I draw breath, the whole purpose of my existence is that Christ be glorified in me. I fade to the background and He shine out real bright. No more me, all Him. But then... It says, and ye in him. Well, what's that saying? It's saying that we've already let the flesh die out. Christ is living in us. But we being a part of him. The Bible says, I've been robed in his righteousness so that the Father sees the Son when he looks at me. The Bible says that I've been yoked together with him, the Son. The Bible says, that I've been made to join heir with him, that I've received the adoption of sonship, whereby we can cry, Abba, Father. The Bible says he's made me a king and a priest. This glorifying of us in Christ is not us getting more attention. There's two types of glorified. First one is the outward glorified. That's where we make something well known, that Christ 
you know, be lifted up, that He be given glory, honor, and praise, and precedence, and position in our lives. But the other glorify is to take something that was once, right, the muck and the mire, the lowest of the low, and make something beautiful out of it. Well, how were we glorified in Christ? That new creature that He put in us? He finishes the work of it. We begin to look more like Him. Our words sound more like the words that He said. Our heart is closer to the heart of God. Our will is in line with the will of God. He's talking about becoming a vessel of honor. Because how can you walk worthy of the calling that God's placed upon your life if you don't have a vessel that you can present to the world that brings honor and glory unto Him? We're not the one getting the credit. Keep in mind, He said, when we came, we weren't worried about what people thought about us. We weren't trying to make a name for us and we weren't men pleasers. He said, we did everything the right way so that you would have a high opinion of Christ. What's that? They were saying, we're just trying to be vessels of honor. If you go back to First Thessalonians, read the verses that we read again. He said that they behaved holy and justly. Holily and justly. In their presence. Do you think that there was anything holy and just about the Apostle Paul in his flesh? No. So where'd that holiness and that being justified come from? Christ. They said we behave the way that we behaved because that's the way that Christ taught us to behave. We were just doing our best to do what He told us to do. But He said we did it the right way. And when you do things the right way, guess what? You're glorified in Christ. Then, goes on to say, according to the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. He says, we don't do this on our own. He says, you don't get to, you know, skip all the steps, go from first grade to graduating in one week. He says, your growth, your glorifying Christ and you being glorified in Christ, comes in waves and it comes according to the grace of God. You know what that means? God's not going to give you more than you can wrap your head around right now. God's not going to give you something now that would destroy you or break you mentally or emotionally. He gives it to you day by day. Right? Growth to growth. Once you tackle one thing, guess what? God's going to have something else. But you're going to have to have mastered the first before you can begin the second. We can all bring glory unto God, but there's some people that have just been praising God for so long, and they do it so regularly, that they just seem to have a knack for it. You know why? Because they've received the grace that God gave them to glorify. Guess what? They were appreciative for it. They just kept working on it. God kept giving them more grace. He'd reveal unto them through His grace what He wanted to show them next and they received that grace in appreciation and made it a part of themselves that's part of what the apostle talks about when he says knowing how to possess your vessel it's by God's grace that he gives us a vessel or something to do for him but there's a difference between knowing that God wants you to do it and how God wants you to do it which is how we started this lesson off this morning See, the more you're committed to doing something for God, the more He's going to show you how you can do it. He may give you more things to do, or He may just want you to work on the thing that you're already doing. But as His grace is revealed unto us, guess what? We're responsible to receive it and to let us be glorified in Christ. What's that mean? He takes this no good, dirty, sin-cursed vessel, but He polishes it up just a little bit more so that when people see it, they say, there's not much special about him, but that one that he's talking about all the time must be really special for him to go through all the effort and to go through all the 
persistence to just do what His Jesus wants them to do. Are we telling you to go out and to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm not moving across this line? No, but you should have those moments in your life. You should know this is where God will let me go and I'm not going one step further. But at the same time, people shouldn't have to ask you where you did. People should know what you believe by how you live. And the more you're glorified in Christ, the more your opinions, the more your beliefs, the more your faith, it'll just come out. You don't need to sit down and have a long discourse with everybody. Okay, I want to sit down everybody and go through the doctrines on why I believe what I believe. Right? Try doing that at the lunchroom one day. See how that goes over for you. Everybody clear out real quick. Now, you don't have to sit down and say, well, here's why what I believe is different from what this person believes. No, Christ just told you to live it. And He promised that through His grace He'd reveal little by little what you need to keep growing in Him. To be matured into what He wants you to be. And as long as you're growing, guess what? You're walking worthy of the God. He didn't say that you have to be perfected in your faith in order to be worthy. No, walking, that's continual. You know what makes you worthy of the God? That you care enough to desire to improve. If we're honest, well, no, we'll never be perfect. If, you know, in this, in this flesh... We're all going to fall short. That's why He robed us in His righteousness. God said, you're good enough right now because when I look at you, I see the Son. Well, why did He give us that robe of righteousness? So that we could continue to mature and the Father would see us, not see our sin, not see what we are now, but see us as we will be and continue to give us grace. As long as we are committed to continue to do Lord, I don't know what you want me to do tomorrow, but I know what you want me to do today. Lord, I don't know how this is going to impact anything, but I believe it's the right thing for me to do. What is it? That? That's just receiving the grace that God gave you, the instructions, the revelation through His Word or through preaching that this is what God would want you to do, or this is how God wants you to change the way that you're currently doing something and saying, yes, Lord, committing it unto yourself and purposing to try to live it. You're going to be able to do it the first day? I don't know. Spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. I know there's a lot of obstacles, but guess what? As long as you're trying, He promised that He would help us. He promised that His grace was made perfect in weakness. What's that mean? The weaker I get, the better His grace is. The better His strength is. The more I understand, Lord, this is what I can do. Help me do the rest. The more that we grow spiritually, guess what? We're continuing to walk. And we're walking worthy. Because we understand what we are isn't good enough. We won't be more like Him. Now, across the room, there are different levels of spirituality. And I don't know them. Only the Holy Ghost does. But you know what I do know? Doesn't matter where you're at. What matters is, is that where God wants you to be. The only way you get from here to where God wants you to be is today. You just got to keep walking. You can either walk worthy of the calling. What's that? Lord, I desire to be what you want me to be. You've shown me this. We're working on this. And I'm just going to keep following after you. You ever going to be perfect? Not in this flesh. But you can be better. Because if you're walking towards being more like Him, that means that you've already accepted that what you are, what you were, never going to be good enough. That's what walking worthy of... Because our calling is that we weren't enough to save ourselves. We weren't enough to redeem you know, or to buy one gold brick in heaven. None of it. We're not worthy. That's why He came. But because of Him, we can be worthy. We can live 
with holiness. We can live justified. We can do things the right way, not because of us, but because of Him. Or we can walk in the mediocrity. But Lord, thank You for saving me, but I want to live this way. You're not walking worthy. You're still walking. We're all walking somewhere. We're all walking some way. But there's only one way to walk worthy. That's His way. Anything else? You've heard me say this. The reason that He said a man cannot serve two masters. You're either growing spiritually or you're dying. There's no in between. The minute that we stop being committed to growing as a Christian, we start dying as a Christian. The minute that we say, well, this isn't, we, we can do this later. What are you deciding? That the things of God don't take priority in your life anymore. But Lord, not now. I'm in the middle of something. But he was in the middle of, by him and through him, all things consist which means running everything that there ever is to run, yet he came and took on the form of a servant, submitted to the death of the cross for you. Whatever it is can wait. You say, Brother Jordan, that's ours. No, that's controversial. Those aren't flattering words, but the true words. You want to know why we speak them? Because, one, it's true. But in order to grow, we have to come face to face with the fact that it's not going to be an easy journey and we're going to have to make decisions that the flesh don't like God may reveal unto us that some of the things that we thought weren't true that we were wrong but you know what the end result is we become more like him Christ is glorified in us and we're glorified in him if we love him that should be the desire of our life trying to come for you and let you know it's going to be hard but he did it first he was tempted in all points like we are yet was he without sin he overcame everything so that he could succor you as a great high priest that he could give you the strength the nourishment the encouragement to overcome whatever it is in your life because he can say I overcame it know exactly what it feels like he says because I overcame it, I can help you overcome it. Yeah, we know that the life of Christian sunshine and roses. But you know what it is? It is a life where the one that is all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent, the one that cares for you more than any understanding that we have of how much somebody could love us, promised that he would walk hand-in-hand hand with you and help you make it to the finish line. I've already seen the end. We make it. None of us fall out. If you're in, you're in. I've seen where we end up. You know what that means? All of us make the trip just fine. The only difference is that some people make the trip holding on to the hand of Jesus. Other people make the trip the way that they thought was best. I've seen the destruction thereof. All the wood, hay, and stubble burn up. But all that gold, silver, and precious gems that we lay up in heaven, walking hand in hand with Him, those will stand the test of time. They'll stand the fiery judgment of God. And we'll be able to lay them down at the feet of Christ and say, we did it all because we love you. You know where all that starts? Walking worthy of what He's called us to do. You know where walking worthy starts? Realizing that if we walk in ourselves, we're unworthy. You say, well, why is it so important? Because we're not walking worthy of the title of a Christian. We're not walking worthy of the Emmanuel Baptist Church. We're walking worthy of what He gave us, the gospel. You know what that means? That we live our lives in a way that if we were to give the gospel to somebody else, they couldn't find fault in us on why not to believe what we told them was true. You know what that means? They've got to believe that you're not a liar. You're not a con man. They said that they didn't come with covetousness. That you're not a gainsayer. Because what did he say? We weren't men pleasers. 
that they went through a lot of hardship and travail just so that other people wouldn't be able to hold a charge against them. They went hungry so that they wouldn't have to ask somebody else for a bite to eat. Now, did they starve? No, they made it. The Lord provided their need. But they were willing to not eat rather than ask somebody for something because it may make them look like they're just preaching for a meal. These guys are just travelers. They're bums. They'll be gone in a few weeks. They're just trying to get as much as they can right now. But walking worthy of the gospel means that when somebody looks at you, they may not like you. They may not agree with what you're wearing. They may not care for the way that you live your life, but they have to admit that when you told it to them, you believed it was true, and that there was no evidence in your life that what you just said was false, had ulterior motives. That's walking worthy of the gospel. You know why seed falls by the wayside in that parable of the sower? Because some people that are casting it, people look at their life and say, I don't want the seed that he's throwing. Still the same gospel that we've got, but they look at the person throwing it and saying, something doesn't smell right here. Something doesn't look right. Why would I want what that person has? Whereas you look at me, you may not like the color of my shirt and tie today, but I do believe that you like the Word of God. I do believe that you like hearing about what God would have for you in your life. And I do believe that what I've taught you today is just what God said, just what God meant. Let me say, there may be something that you don't like about me, but I, I hope and pray that y'all don't think that I'm lying to you while I'm up here. That what I've said is important enough to bring it up. And that I do it out of a heart of love. Because God fitly framed us together. We're a family. If one of us grows, we all grow. If one of us fades, we all fade. What's that mean? We're yoked together. We all got the same burdens to bear, but we're supposed to bear them together. And growth is a family thing. You know, you may wrestle with your siblings. You know what that does? It helps you get stronger. Right? You may play games with family members. And if, if you're playing with the Fosters, if you say something dumb, you're going to get made fun of. But what does that do? It helps you get smarter. Right? Working together, a whole lot better than working alone. But all of us ought to desire to walk worthy. Can't walk worthy of the blood because I'll never be worthy enough for the blood. But he did promise that he would equip us for what? What he called us to do. It's to take the gospel. We can walk worthy of the calling. What is that calling? To take the name of Jesus to the world. But what's worthy about us? That we can say we are what we are today because of Christ. That what we used to be wasn't right, but what we are right now, they can't poke holes in it. They can't look at me and find fault, so they've got to look to Christ, and I promise you they're not going to find fault there. But people are always looking for an excuse to ignore what it is you have to say. Walking worthy of the gospel is that people can't just write you off that what your life says is that this is true and then it's up to them on what they do with it but I wonder how many of us will be saying before the judgment seat of Christ where there's going to be a lot of days where the Lord says you said the right thing you did the right thing but because you weren't walking worthy it didn't have the impact that it was supposed to have because the apostle Paul said right here walking worthy. What's that mean? That He can help us continue to do it. It's not a one-time thing, it's a day-by-day -day thing. And God wouldn't have instructed him to write it if it wasn't imp or if it was impossible for us to walk every day worthy of the calling. Are we worthy of what Christ did for us? Absolutely not. 
But can he use us as a vessel of honor to be worthy to take the name Jesus to the world? Yeah. Not on my authority, on the authority of the holy King James, King James Version 1611 Bible. 